Hey, it's Ed O'Keefe, and welcome to another episode of the Ed O'Keefe Show. Today, I have a very awesome, amazing guest, and if you hear yelling in the background, it's because my five and a half year old is rollerblading through the house, and she's not really that great at it. <laughs> That's totally not true. She's actually pretty good for a five year old, but anyhow, today's guest is my good friend and someone who I've really admired for many years. You know, over the past year, I've really gotten to know him, uh, Mr. Brian Kurtz. Now, Brian, I just had dinner at what he calls his boardroom dinners, which is something really cool we dive into in this in this call. Um, he just came out with a brand new book called The Advertising Solution. Influence your prospects, multiply sales, and promote your brand with uh, legendary direct marketer Craig Simpson. Now, if we don't we don't talk if you're if you're not a big direct response marketing guy don't stress that out at all we kind of just jump around all over the place and you get to hear about like one of the best networking uh examples that brian's ever done and something he learned under the mentorship of marty edelstein who was the founder of boardroom okay so check this out now now during his 34 years at boardroom brian was responsible for mailing of close to two billion pieces (laughs) Uh, of direct mail. Uh, He was also responsible for the distribution of millions of other impressions and promotions in a wide variety of alternate media, like offline, online. For a while there, they had actually a um, infomercial that was just killing it. I think the best they ever did was 150 million in 2006. And just a few years ago, we started something called Titans of Marketing, which was pretty amazing, where he held an event and had tons of guys like legendary uh, Dan Kennedy, and many other super copywriters. Um, so if you want to follow that uh, genre, you'll you love everything he's putting together. Um, and then his blog is amazing. Brian Kurtz, that me. But anyhow, enjoy this. He's a cool dude that has a totally different perspective uh, being in uh, the multi-channel world. Like meaning he doesn't live on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. He comes from the um, direct mail, the actual like how to get something in the, uh, uh, the inbox. Uh, but of the real direct mailbox. And uh, one of the cool things he's doing now is helping online companies go in uh, offline. Um, Hey, one other thing to tell you, this is my second interview with Brian. If you wanna hear him and I go deep into the specifics of lifetime customer value and other things, check out the other interview I did with him. It's on on my show. Uh, You're on iTunes, download it. Um, And, uh, or just uh, check it out on on edokeepshow.com. So that's it. Uh, I hope you enjoy. Please uh, share this with anyone who you feel would be a uh, massive value to. All right, that's it. Enjoy the show. All right, we're live. I'm here with uh, the man, the myth, and the legend, Mr. Brian Kurtz. What's up, Brian? Not much. And uh, mutual, mutual legendary status here, man. I, uh, uh, you know what a big fan I am of yours. And uh, I just love – anytime I get on a podcast for a second time – yeah. It means that either they thought I blew it the first time or they actually liked me. So I'm, either way, it's it's okay. Yeah, it's a win. Well, you know, we were just together. You hosted. I, I, I told my wife this last night. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, we'll take back a little quick backstory is I told my wife last night that, no, actually it was this morning. It was this morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she got in from working out and she's like, hey, can I take a quick shower? And I'm getting the kids ready for school, which always is um means I'm kind of distracted by Good Morning America as I'm making the lunches. But I was thinking about the last, you know, two months of just the relationships that I had been a part of and um, w- about all the people I've, I've been around. And um, I was thinking back on how, you know, we, we finished our time collapsing mega conference. I came home and I was invited by yourself to join you at the um, a boardroom dinner, which we could talk a little bit about. But um the quality of people, man, that you have uh, surrounded yourself with, and I, I'm just really thankful and blessed that you let me hang out. Uh, it was quite a night. It was quite a night. And, and wait, so who was sitting next to me that night? Let me think. Ha! <laughs> well, my. Let me think. Yeah. Yeah, it was you. Right? Yeah, it was me. <laughs> so yeah, you can you can play humble all you want, but you know when I put together great people, you're one of them, and mm. so. Here's the thing, like the boardroom dinners were just an amazing phenomenon. You know, I worked at boardroom for 34 years. We put together these dinners and we, you know, Marty Edelston, who was my mentor and the guy who founded boardroom, used to say there's like no better way to spend an evening than to surround yourself with people who are, who are not only smarter than you, 
but they also revere you for what you do and what your superpower might be. And everybody's sitting there exchanging information about what their passions are, what their superpowers are. You cannot go wrong in a room for an evening yeah. with that format. You know, it's basically like, I remember I said at the beginning of the dinner, I said, you have these dinners and every boardroom dinner we ever did. And I hosted 150 of them while I was at boardroom. And did you really you host those dinners? Wow. It's like, I used to always say, this will be the best boardroom dinner ever. And people would say, oh, Brian, I bet you say that all the time. And I said, yes, I do say it all the time. Yeah. And the reason I say it all the time is that you have that dinner, you're in the present, you're in the moment, you'll never be around that table with those 15 people again. Right. And that group and that dynamic and the one plus one equals three that goes on among those people, it's never going to happen again. So after the dinner, it's like, yeah, I did 150 of these before, but this was the best one ever. And so that's like the whole spirit of, of being in a world where, and as Jay Abraham, one of my mentors and someone I think you know pretty well too, Jay always says, you know, it's all about the, your relationship capital. It's not about networking. It's not about having the most Facebook friends, but you are investing in a bank account called relationship capital. And it's got compound interest built in because I bring you to the dinner, you meet three people, what you've done already. And we gave everybody at the dinner your book, which is incredible, by the way. I love it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so it's like, you know, it's, it's just like being exponential in your life. And you're not going to be exponential sitting alone in your room all day. You got to be out there, whether you're in mastermind groups, whether you, you know, are at going to dinner. I mean, everybody's got to eat. So you might as well eat and do something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I was just so happy you were there. You were an amazing participant at that dinner. And I do those kind of dinners all the time. And everybody can do them. In fact, I don't know if it's possible, you know, after the, uh, you know, at the interview in the show notes or something. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a PDF of something called the boardroom dinners, which is basically um, it's, it's a chapter from a book written by Rick Frischman, who's wrote a book called Networking Magic. And chapter two of the book is called The Boardroom Dinners. And it's all about how the philosophy that I'm talking about here and how you also set them up, like being intentional. Like if you have a couple at the dinner, you split them up. It's funny, at the dinner we were at, we had a married couple and I had them split up and they can't keep their hands off each other. Ah, so. you, you took the words out of my mouth. They cannot keep their hands off. They're great. They're awesome. They were great, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't not sit with each other. So they said, you know, Brian, if I knew that you were going to split us up, I wouldn't have come to dinner. I said, well, I'm glad you're now sitting next to each other. They, they moved the place cards. Like, like I had the place cards set up. They moved them on their own. And you know what? It was fine. You know, <laughs> but I was being intentional because I put each of them in between two other people <laughs> that I thought would in, ad, advance what they were working on. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. Um, so yeah. I, my, my intentions were good, although, you know, they, they kind of undermined it in a good way. And then they had a great time and they were awesome people, as we both know. So it's just an amazing, simple thing. But you know what? It's all, and, and you, you, I know you believe this, Ed, and I'll, I'll turn the tables on you. Is It's always about being intentional in everything you do in your life. You are one of the most intentional people I know. Oh, well, <laughs> well, first of all, thank you. Um, it's so funny you mentioned that, you know, like, I mean, just kind of, I, you know, as I was working out today, uh, I was running and, you know, my mind, I wasn't, I, to, to be fully clear to everybody, I wasn't fully mentally present in, in my training today, but that's okay. I was thinking about, you know, my wife and I, like people ask the question of like, how do you have seven kids and, and do all the stuff we do? And I, I really thought about how it's, it's because we, there's very intentional things that we prioritize, Right. But I, I came away go, from your from your dinner with, um, you know, I, I said yes to join. We had the event, my seminar, you know, so I was gone from my family for a few days, even though the well, I was amazed that you said yes, because I knew you were like, really, really, you know, it was not a great day for you. As Timing I was rough. But, you know, when do you get a, I, I I believe the universe gives you opportunities. And if it, you know, it was aligning perfectly, like um, just to tell everybody, you know, Tim Larkin, who who was um um, the founder of Target Focus Training. Now he's it's it's you know how to kill someone in a single blow type things. Tim Tim was a virtual mentor of mine for years. I love his methodologies and systems. Me too. 
Yeah, he's awesome. Right. And then, then you have um, Joe Polish, who I shared the story. I think I shared it at the table. Maybe I didn't. Yes, he um, did. He, he, ch did. he changed. I mean, he, he was one of my guys that, you know, um, before podcasting and YouTubing was around. That was actually the second time Joe and I actually physically met. And but really didn't get a chance to talk at your Titans event because he was surrounded by 30 people. And um, and just to be in a casual environment where I, you know, you weren't rushing to get uh, FaceTime. Right. And he's right. just a I mean, um, he, he's a phenomenal, dude. phenomenal guy. Yeah. yeah. And, and he's, uh, he's so ADHD, you know, he's a poster trial for ADHD by his own admission. But God, if you can get him to focus, you know, there's like no one on the planet that is better connected and better suited to be the guy that's the conduit. And I call myself the poor man's Joe Polish sometimes as a, <laughs> as a, as a tribute to him. Okay. Yeah. I love it. I'm pretty well connected, but you know, he's doing it at even a higher level. I mean, I'm, I'm more, I may be more connected specifically in the direct response marketing world. Yeah. And he knows all the people I know, but I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm a mile deep in that. He's a mile wide and a mile deep in so many areas, which that's what blows me away. And that's what blew me away from my mentor, Marty, who was a mile wide and a mile deep. It's very hard to be a mile wide and a mile deep. And um, I'm content being a mile deep and not being a mile wide because I do believe that ultimately, you know, uh, we're each an expert in, in something and it's better to be you know, um, like a hundred percent of something than 10% of 10 things. So how do you think, yeah. How do you think Joe and Marty, well, and, and, uh, you could give everybody a little background of who Marty, uh, Edelson, uh, was and uh, in, um, I know we talked about it in the first uh, interview that we did, we went deeper into that. So if yes. any, anyone listening, uh, Brian and I went really, really deep in analytics and direct response last interview. Uh, I'll pull back a little bit. Why, why do you think Joe and what do, what do what do Marty and Joe uh, have done or do that um, allows them to pull that off effectively? Because it really is a gift. It is a gift. I mean, and and you can't do it haphazardly either. Because how do you go? How do you go? I mean, going a mile wide, you don't have to be. You can be. You know, you can kind of be a little bit more superficial. But to go a mile wide and a mile deep with your entire network is very, very difficult. And I think the way they both pull it off, it's a really good question. I never, I never thought about it. Maybe, about maybe we got to, yeah, maybe I got to have Joe on the show to like actually, instead of him teaching a methodology, like kind of extract some of this stuff out of him, you know? I mean, I, you know, I don't think. I, it, I've known him for 20 years. So my observation yeah. would be this. I would say that it's because it is, is it's, it's the only thing in a way like everything about him is about is about that. Like it's not like, you know, look, I was at boardroom for 34 years. I, I, I was running a big business. You know, I I think you almost have to make it your full time job not to be a networker. Networking is a bad word. Horrible you word. You have to be 100 yep. percent contribution. Now, I think you and I oh, are very much in the world of contribution. I really do. Um, but I don't know that. Even though I live it and I breathe it as, as much as I can every day, I think my distractions that get me away from being 100% contribution that, that Joe and people like Joe and Marty might not get away from it as often as I do. I'm, I'm pretty good. I mean, I'm pretty immersed in it. But I think where they take it that next step is that it's like everything about their life is about contributing to connect. Like I'm going to yeah. make sure that I take care of everybody in my life at the deepest level and with nothing, no expectation of return, which again, you and I, I think both believe in all that, but I, I think it's their number one. It's, it's the only thing almost sometimes for them. So I think it's, maybe it's just a matter of, of time and effort in, in doing it because you can't do it haphazardly. And even, I think going a mile deep and not going a mile wide, like I do, um, requires way more time than most people would actually uh, want to give to any one thing. But you got to love it. You know, I just love direct response marketing. So yeah, yeah. Me, never working in a way. That's cool. That's very, very cool. That's another thing. Joe and, and, and Marty were never working. You know, Marty had a thing on the huh. back of the business card, um, which is like an, a, a, a um, it's an ancient, uh, it's a saying, I don't know if it's from, uh, uh, I think, it, it, I don't know if it's Confucius or something, but it's basically like 
you know, the trick in life is to like never know whether someone is working or playing. They're always doing both. That's kind of the, the crux of it. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. That, I think you, that's it. I think yeah. I got to it after like, you know, blabbering for a minute or two. There. No, that's, that's really I think cool. That's the key. It's like people who, where their work is their play. Uh, in fact, you know, I'm going to just walk away from the microphone for a little bit, but I just want to grab, if I can find it, I'd love to grab that. I don't know, but I have my fingertips. Okay. Uh, do, I do, have do. the back of Marty's <laughs> business card. Um, and it's just, it's a great saying. Um, if I can, if I can put my hands on it, I'm going to read it to you at some point during this call. Fantastic. So, so you switching from when you were, um, here's a question for you, switching from when you were running boardroom, right. And you, you know, like where has your contribution focus, uh, from the relationship side, um, you know, when you prior, when you were running uh boardroom, which, at your peak, was that 150 million, Brian? I can't remember. I think we did about. I think, I think the, the, the year, either 2005 or 2006, we did 157 million. That's million. that's fantastic. And uh, where was your where comparatively to the, then versus now running a, a mastermind, doing some consulting and and uh figuring out what you want to be when you get older um <laughs> you know um where how how do you perceive the contribution uh focal points are different then versus now like who you know like the who that's what where great, when i love that question that's yeah a great question um so my, my 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 um my basic you know livelihood premise uh, reason for being hasn't changed. I mean, I'm, I'm, contra I'm contribute to connect. I mean, I've always been that. The biggest difference is that I leave boardroom. You know, I, I was a, a partial owner of the company. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to buy it. Um, uh, for whatever reason, it just wasn't going to happen. And, and it was fine because I think, you know, I love the fact that his kids are are doing what they want with it and, and it's got a great legacy and, and the guy who founded it, Marty Elston, who we mentioned, was like a second father to me. So the whole thing was good. I left on a really good note after doing a, a tribute event to him and it was just wonderful. But the difference is that when I left, it was like, okay, I just got off this 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 roller coaster called, you know, hundred there wasn't a hundred when I left it was about forty million dollars. That's a story in itself to go from 150 back to 40. But for the most of the time I was there, we were in the neighborhood of, you know, somewhere between 70 and 100 million was kind of the sweet spot. And so to go from a, we'll call it a 70 to 100 million dollar business with 80 to 100 employees with, you know, variety of products and new product development and vendors up the wazoo and overhead and payroll and all that stuff to, um, Basic and, and and a database of you know nine million customers and former customers who were supplying health information to and saving lives, changing lives, all of that kind of stuff. So you know, making such a big contribution to the world that way, and then so the contribution becomes sort of like a broad-based consumer publisher contributes to millions of people with their newsletters, books, and information. Then I leave and it's like, okay, I don't have that anymore. Right, so right, right. Is that, is that like an empty contribution now? Yeah. So the fact that I started two mastermind groups, so I have two groups running, one for very high-end direct response marketers, the other for incredible up-and-coming entrepreneurs, copywriters, marketers, people who not quite as big but are just all into heart-centered entrepreneurship, they want to get to that next level. I mean, the biggest company in that second group might be two or three million, and they all want to be $50 million businesses. So now what's the contribution? The contribution is if I can get the 50 companies that are in both my groups, between the two mastermind groups, I'm probably touching 50 companies slash entrepreneurs. If I could get each of them to 10x or 5x and – and they're all like I, I, every one of them I put into my groups with one on one Skype interviews. So in other words, they had to have that heart centered entrepreneurship. They had to have a mission, not that they had to be altruistic and charitable all the time. I mean, I wanted them all to make a profit, but they wanted to do stuff that bettered the world, you know, whether it was, you know, helping bar and restaurant owners, you know, or helping um, 
uh, people who had had uh, lost, you know, loved ones or, or had, had had parents who were in de- had dementia and they wanted to create courses for that. Or they, you know, I, I can go on and on, but every one of them had a more interesting business than the next one. And if I can be the be the conduit to contribute to their growth, I have a feeling that having 50 companies and or entrepreneurs, each one doing 10x or 5x might actually get me to touch more people yeah, right. in the world Correct. than the you know two or three million active customers at boardroom in any one year. So I guess that's the difference in mindset, but the the idea of contribution never goes away and it shouldn't go away for anybody. But I think once you realize and, and I don't know, Ed, I you know you have a pretty big company and a couple of different companies and I don't know if I'm ever gonna go back there, you know, to because people say, oh, Brian, don't you want to launch another company like Boardroom? Or, you know, don't you want to do another Titans event? And don't you want to do this? Don't you want to do that? I don't know. As you said, I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. Yeah, I do yeah that. right. Yeah, go on. Keep going. Yeah. I want to be a direct response educator. Yeah. And how that takes shape to help other people be better at what they do. Because marketing isn't everything. It's the only thing. It really, you can't do shit in this world unless you've got an amazing marketing operation behind you. And that's not about selling more shit to more people. It's about, you know, really being committed to what you're doing and who you want to touch and, you know, who you want to contribute to and who you want them, what you want them to be in the world. And I know I'm, I'm preaching to the converted when I talk to you. And so because you're you're totally into this as your new book, you know, exemplifies. And, you know, I'm sure the people that listen to you in a podcast, and that's why I feel privileged being here. I assume have this mindset. I hope well, they do. Well, yeah, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, um, I think we're. I, I'd like to go down this rabbit hole a little bit because, um, by the way, I, I, a chapter in my book is called "The Ghost of Your Past Self," where I talk about, you know, when I was the reason why I got out of the dental marketing business, and I was, you know, it's so funny. I was sitting with Frank Kern, Vinnie Fisher, Roland Fraser, Perry Belcher, uh, Ryan Dice, just you know, two nights ago. Um, wow. Yeah, and that was one of my tables that, you know, I was thinking, and, and by the way, I didn't I didn't finish the punchline in my little story of pinching myself. My wife comes walking around the corner <laughs> after sh- showering and looking good, and I'm like, damn, I was just talking about, thinking in my head about how I just need to pinch myself because of all the great things I have in my life, and then you walk around the corner. Bam, na- put the wow. nail put the nail in the coffin, baby. I love but, it. Yeah, it was great. But um, where I want to go slightly... I want so you're sitting sitting around with all these 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 superstar marketers. Yeah, and you know the we were talking about continuity income and, and creating membership and the reason why you know we we're talking about the different models like why high ticket is actually high stress in some ways because you're always pushing to get your next like the guys in that model versus doing a uh, you know a mastermind or a, even a lower level continuity that has um, secured continuity income. We were just talking about that. And when I, one of the things I said is, I like, well, you know, when I was in dentistry, man, I had um, hundreds of people on monthly continuity. And then one of the guys had said, oh, well, yeah, but, you, you know, why would you ever leave that business? And there's a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons that I left it was because I that was the ghost of who I was 10 years prior. You know, at that time, I was ready to move on. So um, Transitioning from being an operator in a business to being a mentor or coach, or uh, and I and I, I transitioned into being an operator of a, of a supplement company, but um, w- there had to be a time, some some kind of scary moments for you internally of just looking at like, you know, I kind of got to go. You you had to go create your own future again, correct? Yes, um, you know, I yes, I mean, it was a little bit more, you know, eating what I killed. Even though at Boardroom, you know, while I didn't start the company, you know, I was an owner and I did feel, you know, very much the entrepreneur, but not, it's not the same. You're right. I mean, I think, and, and as you said, it's like everybody has, you were sitting around with all those superstars talking about all the different marketing models and, you know, there's the $47 product, Ascension program, you know, product launch formula, whatever. And then there's like the, the, what the model I chose, which was, you know, the one with that says, Hey, 34 years of building, um, a, a bank account, not money, but a bank account called relationship capital. What does that do for you? Well, what it did for me is that I was able to do a descension model, 
And the first thing I did was create a twenty to twenty-five thousand dollar mastermind group, and and yet I'm yearning to do the courses, you know, for ninety-nine dollars or one hundred ninety-seven dollars, because then I'll be able to reach people directly in other ways besides being the mentor coach, as you said. I liked I like that the way you put it. It was better. You you kind of cut to the chase. It was like owner operator to mentor coach, and how you can still make huge contributions in both camps but you're right i think it was i was never scared about it yeah that's probably the wrong term right right right. exactly i I didn't know what it was going to be but it was it what you know i the thing that i i think that was hard i don't know that boardroom was a a a former self to use your your term but (laughs) it was certainly a you know it was my heritage for sure it was what i was known for but what I'm finding in the last couple of years is that what I was really known for, even though people introduced me about, oh, he mailed a billion pieces of direct mail and, he, you know, they, whatever they want to say about me. And, you know, we, we, we talked about the size of my company, but that's not what people are like talking about. They're actually talking about this guy's got a pretty good sense of direct response. He's got a really good sense of copy. He's got. So it's actually been a reaffirmation of the skills that got me there. Yeah, yeah, yep, totally. Totally. So I'm no longer like the guy who ran boardroom, although a lot of people do pigeonhole me there. I'm the guy who is like a direct response junkie, and I'm cool with that. Yes. I'd rather be the direct response junkie than the guy who ran boardroom. Then let's segue into um, – I, I had a question uh, that when you brought it up of like you know, people just because they're listening to my podcast – um, there that they would get direct response. Now I have to tell you, I have people so close to me in my life who have access to everything I do. They could see what I do, yet they still think that just being good or having a product that's the best product is going to sell itself. And um, you know that's the old uh, you know uh, you know I have a good product. I, mean, I built a better mousetrap. The world's going to be the path to my door. Uh, ain't gonna happen. But I'm broke, right? Yeah, exactly. So let's talk a little bit about uh, d- you know like direct response and why the importance of understanding the ability to to offer structure or or where would you go with that? I'll just leave an open ended question there, Brian. It's a great question also, and, and, and it actually is one of the reasons why I decided to do the book I just did with Craig Simpson. He was putting together this book from like six greats of advertising. I mean, the book's called The Advertising Solution, which is not a good title, and I couldn't fight the publisher on it because I came into the project too late, but then I used it to my advantage that if these six guys, and the six guys are David Ogilvy, Claude Hopkins, John Caples, Robert Collier, Mm -hmm. Gary Halbert, and Gene Schwartz. These are six of the greatest, quote-unquote, advertising men of all time. Or we, uh, for lack of a better term, for those of people who are listening that watch, you know, TV regularly, they were madmen. They were the madmen. Yeah. Um, And it was like, you know, they came out of an era that said, if I give you a beautiful ad for Lucky Strike Cigarettes, and it's a beautiful ad, and we put a campaign in a bunch of magazines... And that year we sell more cigarettes, I guess the ad might have worked. And I'm like, wow, what a life to live. I, 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 I get hives when, when people talk to me like that. You know, general advertising, not measurable, forget about it. So the idea that direct marketing, which is my passion and your passion too, that every piece of advertising that you buy, every piece of media that you spend on has an ROI that you can measure – is to me the only way to advertise. So the idea that these six guys, when I started, and I knew about all six, I had read all of them, and Craig brought it to me, and I said, oh, the book's about advertising? Screw that, I'm not going to do that. But it's not. The book is about um, the book's about uh, direct marketing because these six guys were basically direct marketers trapped in general advertiser bodies, mm. and they understood that everything that, had, they had to do needed to be measurable. So that was just super exciting to do. And then taking it a step further, since Gene Schwartz, one of the six, was a personal mentor of mine, and I, I, I'm republishing his, his classic breakthrough advertising. And Gene was one of these guys that always talked about, it's a copywriter now, right? And he would always talk about the copywriter can't create desire. You know, you have to, and that's what you, now you go back to what you, your point at the beginning of this question, which was, you know, just because you have a great product, 
you know, you have to know that there's a mass desire for that. That's right. And so, you know, he was just, he was just the master. And, and what happened, then I started reading, uh, rereading all the stuff from these six guys. And while they all wrote copy, they were all actually much more interested in, in lists and, 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 um, and the marketplace than they were about the copy they were writing. And, you know, they could only harness the desire. They weren't going to create the desire. And so anybody who is even an entrepreneur who doesn't want to learn about marketing, who is outsourcing their marketing, they need to know about this so they could ask the people that they're outsourcing the marketing to what what's the deal, man? You know, is you just you just ran a campaign on Facebook for me that cost me a thousand bucks. When am I getting that back and how am I getting that back? And even if I don't get that back on the first order, which is fine. How do I get that back on a lifetime? In other words, yeah, totally. have you tracked it, Mr. Facebook advertising expert, based on my product and what I'm selling on the back end? Because we all know we have to have back end and continuity, um, which is another topic altogether, which you're an expert on. Um, and, and I did a lot of it myself, that you have to be able to calculate that. So, you know, if the, if the rabbit hole we just went down is, you know, marketing isn't everything, it's the only thing. And that understanding the fundamentals of marketing and advertising in order to do what you want to do in the world and share your mission or vision with the world, you know, count me in, count me in. You know, it's like the Picasso quote, you know, learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. Yeah. And, and that's what the great marketers, the people that you were sitting around that table with, I mean, those guys, I mean, I know Frank really well and Frank Kern will tell you that. Um, in fact, when I came out with my Titans product, he couldn't wait to buy it. He was like, he, I remember he got on the phone with me. He goes, you knew Gino Schwartz. I called him Gino. So he, nobody ever called Gene Schwartz Gino, but you know, typical Frank Kern, right? Dude, you knew, you knew Gene, you knew Gino Schwartz. And, um, you know, Frank Kern studied those guys and never, nobody still, realized that. Yeah. I mean, Frank will tell you, he still studies. I mean, he's, totally. he's a beast. That's why he's able to do, you know, the, like, dude, dude, where's my surfboard? Yeah, you know, is, no. is not a cover up. It's like that's just his language to his audience. But the guy's a freaking genius yeah. because he's a student of direct marketing and copy. And, you know, I just marvel at that. Stuff. Well, here's the funny thing. I mean, I had two things I want to share. With you. One was, you know, Titans of Marketing. You had Dan, <clears throat> Dan Kennedy speak there. Dan was one of the one of the most influential early mentors on direct response for myself and and frankly because people be like have you seen dan lately i'm like well no i mean first of all dan doesn't invite people just to hang out uh no, of course the eighteen thousand eight hundred dollars. that's right yeah. <laughs> but which is deservedly but when i'm when i need to be like i'm writing copy for an event guess what i pull out some of his swipes because they they were some of the best ones out there and i'll tell you a funny story i was at the bar while out at Titans with some of your, uh, some of the, uh, you know, super high level copywriters, right? Um, who you know all the names, right? But I was funny, I forget who I was talking to, but I'm like, well, yeah, you know, uh, Dan Kennedy and the guy made a comment like, well, Dan's not the world's best, he's not, he's not the best copywriter, but he is probably the best marketer of us all. And, and I'm like, okay. So in other words, you're saying, since he's making more money than I am, He's not as good of a writer as I am, but he understands copy plus marketing. Exactly. And there's yeah, well put. I there's mean, a good. There's some gene. There's genius in that comment. You know. There is. You know. In fact, I go to AWAI, which is the copywriters, you know, forum where they all congregate, <laughs> and I spoke there for the third time just this last month. And when I'm, I basically say to them, if you don't understand direct marketing principles, shame on you. Because you want to be a copywriter and you think you're just going to put your feet up on the veranda in France and collect royalties because you wrote a piece of, piece of brilliant copy? Think again. Totally, if dude. You, if you totally. write that copy and it goes to the wrong audience with the wrong offer, you've got no chance of selling a thing. However, if you wrote a mediocre piece of copy and it was the perfect list like affiliate or it was the perfect list that you rented and it was the perfect offer, yeah. you will make money. You may not make as much if the copy's mediocre, but you'll make money. And so this idea that the copywriter rules all, although believe me, I am, you know, I've worked with the best copywriters who've ever lived my whole career because they were worth it. And I paid them top dollar because they were worth it. But I also didn't 
waste my time on an A-list copywriter mm. when I didn't have my list selection. Yeah, program. yeah. I didn't have my segmentation and database marketing in place. I didn't have great offers. I mean, you're a, you're you're an offer maven. I mean, you know that. If you have the wrong offer, you're dead. Well, you, you, let me let's let's say yeah. So like nowadays, one of the biggest things are, and I think this is what the benefit of running. Uh, a couple companies, but you know, you know, I started my first business with uh, when before Dennis Profits took off. I was literally, uh, you know, going to Office Max, picking up the sales letters, which were were sixteen to twenty page sales letters, order form, you know. And this is before the internet was was really anything. And I was, I, I had the system dialed in. I'd have my audio tapes, my direct mail pieces. I put them in, uh, you know, headline faces. The back cover, real stamp, handwritten. I had that system dialed in. So I built that company from doing that to generating my own leads to, you know, listen. I would, Brian, I would, I would listen in. Uh, we were doing the 1 800, uh, we were doing the ads. I'll slow down a little bit because I get a little excited. Yeah, you, when you're talking direct response, I, I get you excited. When, when <laughs> I'd run ads, and they'd come to the toll-free record, 24-hour recorded hotline, and people would leave their names and address and, you know. Um, cash flow is so tight that I, 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 instead of waiting for the transcription service to get them to me tomorrow, I would physically call the recording hotline myself and listen to all of them and make sure I got them out by 3 p.m. because I figured out that cash flow would come in three to four days earlier the faster I got the direct mail pieces out. You know, I, I, I needed the money. Here's why I share that story. Because I've taken that approach with every single thing we've done, every campaign and whatever. And so nowadays, when we're dealing with Facebook guys or media buyers, where a lot of CEOs make the biggest mistake is they go, oh, these guys know how to buy media. Let them go do their thing. Mm. And what a lot of these guys will do is they'll go spend your 30, 40 grand and they'll give you that. Well, we need to test a ton of uh, sources and we got to, you know, cast a broad net and then we'll find some winners. That's a that's a big red flag, right? No, you're like, yeah, I'm throwing up in my mouth. Yeah. Instead, you, you the so for everyone listening, like they should know if they're really worth like their selection, right? Like so, in, in direct mail, would be list selection, uh, but Facebook marketers or even media site buyers or email drop buyers, if they don't have the three to five places where that thing, if it does not respond well there, it's not going to respond anywhere else. And, um, you know, we call that ground zero, but if, if they don't have their, then if they don't like we're, we're a real good buyer is worth their money is that they understand where we're going first. And if it doesn't work there, then we got to retweak the offer, uh, or have a different message or something. It's sort of like going out, it's sort of like a copywriter, you know, you lead, you, know, you don't bury the lead just like in copy, you don't bury the the best media first to try to find out. And I, I'll give you how we used to do it in direct mail. Right? Yeah, so tell me. I yeah, it's great. product in direct mail. Um, and this was a lot of money. It was postage printing. I mean, I'm, I'm launching a book or a newsletter. And the first thing that I did is I went to my list brokers, which are the people that went and found you the list, just like the Facebook guy would find you the universe there. And what they would do is that they would have to give me a notebook, like a loose leaf binder with I basically called it the primary, secondary, church. it was basically a list universe report. And they would give me what I call the primary, secondary, and tertiary Love it. list universe yep. that are available for that product. And they had to give me the reasons why, and we call them data cards, every, every list had a data card. And they had to put, like, why were the data cards in primary, not in secondary or tertiary? Why would they think that if the, all the lists and, and you never got 100 percent of your list to work, you wanted to get about 20 percent to work. But if in that scenario, if I didn't get 30 percent or so of the list to work in the primary universe in the launch, if they did their work right and I did my questioning right of these yeah. lists, I knew I didn't have a product that was worth going out again until, as you said, you know, retweak, retool, do something because you know what? If those, if, if those, if I didn't get a good 30% of those primary lists to work, I'm not even looking at the secondary and tertiary. 
Right. And what's really awesome about that is that's also risk mitigation and, yes. uh, you know, and I had to really risk mitigation, you know, think about it. I'm paying postage and printing. I mean, you know that I did the uh, blog post once that said, you know, why paying postage made me a better marketer. We just proved it. Love it. I, but I couldn't afford to screw around because just because email marketing or Facebook is so cheap doesn't mean you should screw around there either. That's right. And actually, I'm going to go. I got to get that art blog post because that's, you know, so here's you want to hear something crazy. OK, going full circle. So people are, are, are like, hey, you know, um, I just came back from a meeting and, and one of my friends is doing over 20 million a year in direct mail in the health supplement business. And I said, all right, let me just ask. And we used to be in direct mail. And so I started talking to him and I'm like, he's not doing anything rocket science test. Like this is everything that you cover in the advertising solution. He's just doing the basic fundamentals really well. Yes. And um, here's, here's though an interesting statistic is we have a campaign running in my health business right now where we're generating leads for 30 cents a lead. Okay, not bad. Not bad. However, when I noticed our, it just wasn't backing out profitable wise, like it just wasn't profit. I was like, how the hell are we not profitable? If these people have these issues, why wouldn't they be buying? So me being my curious self, start diving into my email uh, providers stats. And I realized that over 55% of our emails are just purely uh, the open rates on them are so ridiculously low. There's no uh, solution other than that those e um, emails are just getting dumped into. There, no one's even seeing them, right? So I, ca I calculated what our cost per open and cost per click were. The cost per open was close to four bucks, brother. Oh, my God, oh my God right? Because of that, those issues. So... In our business right now, we're warming up other IPs and we're doing some stuff. But I was like, you know what? I'm going to, I really, after talk, after that statistic and then talking to a friend of mine, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to just start pulling out the data and start looking at my, um, just do old school, like recency, frequency, and um, yeah. money rate and start just mailing these guys offers that are converting well online in the direct mail. Like it, it, your cost per open there is almost guaranteed to be what, 70 cents or something like that? Right. And I think that, you know, just using, as you said, basic RFM. I was at this copy, going back, going full circle on the copywriter thing. I was in front of 500 copywriters, Ed. I asked in the room how many people know what RFM is. And two people raised their hand. Now, I think there are probably a few more that just didn't raise their hand, but not yeah. a lot more. That's scary. Two people out of 500 people who want to be aspiring or aspiring copywriters did not know recency, frequency, and monetary value as the like one of the cornerstones of direct marketing. And as a copywriter, understanding that if you're writing copy to someone who just responded a week ago versus someone who bought five products, that's frequent. So a week ago, that's recency. Someone who, who, who bought eight products instead of two, that's frequency. And someone who spent $1,000 versus $8 and that you wouldn't have three copy approaches to those three people. If you don't understand that on a base level, besides all the intricacies, and I think we did take a little more of a deep dive in our last That's interview, okay. But if you don't understand any of that basic stuff, how are you going to be a great copywriter? I just don't see it. Right. Well, because people fall in love with the craft, you know, if they're, 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 they just want to, just want to write and, yes. Yes. and, uh, you know, let me do your next campaign, but then don't go back and look at what's actually working elsewhere. And I mean, just the research side of it. I mean, we can go on and on. Let me ask a question. What um, kind of going, I kind of want to go two ways. I'm just trying to figure out time-wise where I could take you. What are you seeing as far as like, I think as a CEO, uh, an advisor right now to other companies, the frustration all like you know it's funny we were when we were sitting around the table i i said a joke like it seems like the experts who want to be advisors seem to want a lot of money for very little work nowadays um but if i wanted to build a team of like i got my traffic guy or list guy or copywriter guy and i got you know how are you seeing and how are you seeing the incentivizing of man, like so, you, you and here's where I'm going. You manage and incentivize world class copywriters in the past, right? 
How are you seeing it if working effectively nowadays with the combo of, you know, what you can you can take this what you're seeing across internet marketing businesses or online businesses or even still um uh indirect mail. My challenge nowadays it seems is that a lot of these guys want to be paid a lot of money flat across the board and they want to be paid part of the upside. So where's the healthy balance that allows a company to win and simultaneously allows you to attract some of the um, better talent? Well, I think, you know, my philosophy, especially on copy, but in other areas too, but especially copy, was that, you know, why do you pay you know, A-list copywriters a shitload of money, and the, obviously the answer is because they're worth it. Yeah. Um, but you, so you got to make sure you, you're dealing with the right people. The, the idea that there are people asking for a lot of money who aren't worth it or aren't working hard for it, I think that's the responsibility of the CEO, business owner, to know, you know, who the real players are and who the imposters are. And that takes a lot of hard work in terms of the mm. diligence you want to do before you lay down a check to somebody. I mean, I had a guy today, a potential consulting client, and I don't like to do a lot of one-on-one consulting, but I like this business. I think it's got a lot of potential. And, um, you know, he was like, well, you know, if I pay you your monthly retainer, well, what's, what's to say that you're not going to just collect that and, you know, not do anything? I'm like, all right, well, if that's what you're used to and that's, your, and that's something that is sort of like um, an expectation, don't hire me. You know, I'm all about over delivery. And and so I think a lot of it is in the questioning. The fact that he said that almost told me I didn't want to work for him. You know what I mean? Right. Because he's coming out of that operating model looking for that. It's a scarcity mindset. It really is. So let me give you the opposite. Yeah. Give me the opposite. Yeah. So I told Marty, um, uh, I told this story on 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 a podcast recently and or some variation of it. But there were years at boardroom where the biggest checks that went out. Um, for anything, um, or, or at least if you took the money that we gave to certain copywriters who were getting royalties, the numbers that we were sending were probably more than, in fact, I know for a fact there was one year where, you know, the money we paid to one copywriter in royalties was more than what Marty and I were both taking as salaries. Wow. For the year. And so the CFO walks into our office and he says, What's this? This is crazy. I could, you know, you got to renegotiate this contract. And like Marty and I had the same reaction. It's like, do you realize that because we're paying, you know, this copywriter a million one or whatever we were paying him on that one check, who had, and he had multiple um, clients, you know how much we're making? And not only that, the fact that his copy is so freaking good that it's bringing in people that are customers that are staying with us for two and three years. Uh, a subscribers for two and three years, he's basically the backbone of our business in some ways. So, <laughs> right, right. Because you know, we were in the business of renewals. Marty and I used to look at each other and say, we're in the business of, of the renewals to bottom line personal more than what we are in the business of selling books or, or selling front end subscriptions, as you know, in terms of continuity. So, the scarcity mindset that is out there is prevalent. Um, there are, I think one of the good things about the affiliate marketplace, yeah. the way it's, 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 it's taken shape in the yeah. online world. And look, we had, you know, any affiliate marketer today who thinks they invented affiliate marketing, go back to 1960 and watch what Reader's Digest was doing selling insurance. Right. But I think that the affiliate marketplace at least has gotten a mindset that says, I'm willing to give up 50% of my revenue yep. to get a goddamn good list. That's right? right. That's right. So that's a good, that's the good news. The bad news is that because the list is so good and so targeted and so endorsed by the affiliate partner that then we don't pay enough attention to the creative where we could actually get a lot more out of those affiliate partnerships and out of those <laughs> lists. The ones who do the best, as we both know, are the ones that really invest in the creative are the ones that you know totally invest in the bonuses that they give when they they are an affiliate for someone else. Those are the ones that make the most money, and so the creative combined with that is really good. So if there's already a mindset out there in the internet marketplace, uh, in an internet uh, online marketing marketplace that says I'm willing to give up 50% of my sales to get a good list, 
why wouldn't you give up another 5% to get world class copy? And so that that's I, I a great that's that, a great question. That's a good way of looking yeah, at and it. I, like and, it. It's, and it's not terrible, Ed. It's not, you know, I see some people who are willing to invest, but there is still for some reason a bit of a scarcity mindset. But your point is a po- important one too that if you choose the wrong copywriter or the wrong affiliate, it's going to it's going to bite you and and that's the due diligence of the CEO to make sure that you're partnering with the right people. Yeah. I, mean, I hate to say it that way, but it's the onus is on us as CEOs, right? Yeah. And well, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I just wrote down uh, a couple good notes on that. So I appreciate that. So, hey, man, we're running out of time here. Um, I, I, I know you and I could talk all day. <laughs> yes, we um, could. I guess the last uh, last question is kind of a, a dual edge, uh, a dual uh, question, which is like, what what are you most excited about and what? Can uh, what are any parting words that you'd like to uh, give to the audience, and how could they find out about your book and all that fun stuff? Right. So I'm excited about a lot of shit, um, <laughs> but the thing there's one concept which I'm I'm particularly excited about that just popped into my head because I've been working on it with a couple of clients, and it's what I call O to O to O, O to O to O, and what it, what that means is online to offline to online or offline to online to offline. And what that means is that I'm just excited about multi-channel marketing. I'm excited about um, that. I'm excited about Facebook. I'm excited about Google. I'm excited about direct mail still. I'm excited about radio. I'm excited about TV. I'm excited about inserts in packages. I'm excited about Mm. print advertising in newspapers while they're still alive. I'm excited about any medium that's going to work. Love it. So, the O to O to O takes that to another dimension, which is, and I've got a couple of clients. Like I have two clients right now, and I, I'm just hoping that I'm going to have case histories that are just going to be so interesting in that they're digital marketers for the most part. All of their content, their info marketers, their content is, and I can see this with supplements too. Um, Sorry. What? They sell exclusively digitally. They are um, um, they can create physical product from the digital, whether it's books, DVDs, transcripts, reports, whatever. And to take their digital, best digital offers, create a direct mail campaign, do a direct mail campaign that actually is an apples to oranges offer. Like it doesn't look like the same offer they're offering online, but it's a lot of the same product, reposition, repackaged, into physical product, which is what you need for direct mail, sell direct mail, sell it independently from what they're doing online to a completely different list universe, bring people in then who want to still respond through direct mail, especially if your audience is 50 plus or 60 plus, direct mail still works really, really well. Yeah. Um, you bring in these names in direct mail, you follow up with a direct mail upsell of some sort, and eventually you give them an opportunity to then get a downloadable something to see who of that direct mail audience is interested in, you know, a digital report, anything online, but we take a little time before we put them online. And now we find out, we get their email address, we get them into an email online funnel. Yep. And now you've got the beauty, you've got the advantages of someone who originated in direct mail, who's going to have a much higher lifetime value, much higher engagement factor, at the acquisition stage, and we might be able to do a lot of the cross-sell and upsell and continuity online, which is going to be a lot cheaper because you save postage and printing and delivery of product, and then you can move back and forth. That doesn't mean that once they're in an online funnel, now you start looking at the lifetime value of that customer because if they originated in direct mail, they probably have a higher lifetime value already. They're going to have all this online sales. We still can come back with a direct mail offer that's actually very high ticket, for example. Yeah, and right. I just love the idea that if we can toggle between all in all media with different messaging, but still just killer content that's really targeted to the list. You know, again, going back to what we talked about, I'm pretty excited about that concept, and I think I'm the guy that can be the most helpful. And and, and the guy, as Jay Abraham says. I, I'm the one to take up the gauntlet yep. of teaching direct mail to online marketers and then how to work it into their entire um, 
um, uh, DNA, infrastructure, whatever. And I just, I'm excited about that. I think there's a lot of uh, permutations of that that can work. I think, I think it'll force a lot of digital marketers to actually make their products even better when they create physical product versions of it if they haven't already. Yeah. Just a lot of, there's a lot of benefits of all that. So that's, I'd say that's one of the things I'm super, super excited about. I love it, man. I love it. What most people don't realize, like in our, in our, our supplement business, 30 to 40% of our sales come from our phone, like inbound phone calls. Oh yeah. The phone is like ignored and everything's you have to put them right online. But that's, that's our customers who prefer <clears throat> to read something and make a phone call, you know? Right. So I love it. And, and the ability of the, of the operator to be able to do the upsell, I mean, it's more expensive on the phone, but your lifetime value and more people, I bet you get a lot more people into continuity. More in the continuity, the trust levels are high. I mean, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. So, um, so Brian, uh, to wrap up, unfortunately, um, what is an ask or how could people follow you or um, you know stay in touch with you or buy from you and, and how can we serve you? Well, thanks, Ed. I, I think that the big thing is I really want to get my book into as many hands as possible. I don't make any money on the book. You know, it goes through Amazon or Barnes & Noble. So the book's called The Advertising Solution. You can go to Amazon and buy it, but don't do it that way. Do it the way I'm going to tell you to do it because then I'm going to over-deliver. And give awesome. You I love it. I love it. So you go to a site called thelegendsbook.com. The T -H -E -L -E -G -E -N -D -S -S T-H-E-L-E-G-E-N-D-S dot com. The Legends Book, and that, it's the Legends B O O K dot com. The Legends Book dot com. Go there, you will see very simply that you'll see that there are all these incredible bonuses. One is a swipe file of all of the greatest ads and all of the greatest promotions from the six legends that I profile in the book: Ogilvy, Hopkins, Collier, Caples, uh, Halbert, and Schwartz. There's also videos of Halbert Schwartz and Ogilvy. No kidding. That you no can kidding. access. Yeah. One of them is actually David Ogilvy on the David Letterman show, which is very cool. Oh, my gosh. That's, and then that's amazing. there's a downloadable PDF of Scientific Advertising, which is the classic book by Claude Hopkins, written in 1923, 100% relevant today, one of the most important books everybody should read. But the PDF on that site is a special illustrated and annotated version of scientific advertising by copywriter Bob Bly, and you can download that. So you get all that stuff for free, plus like five other reports that my co-author Craig Simpson put together. So you go to thelegendsbook.com. It says two steps. Go buy the book. You can buy it anywhere you want. Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You hit a button right on the site. You go, opens up a window. You buy the book on, on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or Indie Books. Then you come back with your receipt to an email address that's on the yep, site. Yep. And then you get to download all of those bonuses after buying the book. And at the same time, you also then opt into my list. Um, I don't do affiliates. I don't sell a lot of stuff on the back end at all. Um, what I do is I blog almost every week uh, on all sorts of topics on direct mail. If you don't want to buy the book, which I think would be silly on your part, but if you don't want to buy the book and you just want to opt into my list, and get all my stuff for free as well. It's briankurtz.me, B-R-I-A-N-K-U-R-T-Z.me. And there's a lot of free content there, and you can get on my blog list and all of that. But you do the same thing if you buy the book at thelegendsbook.com. I love it. And, and I just love sharing, you know, what I'm doing. I mean, I had a two-hour interview earlier this week with Jay Abraham. and um, Did you really? He, awesome. Yeah, and Jay is a really close friend and mentor and – Jay is like on my case in a good way all the time. He says, look, Brian, you're doing fine. You know, people seem to like you. You know, We make jokes about it. And, <laughs> you know, people like what you're contributing. But you know what, Brian? You got to if you really want to pick up the gauntlet and say you're the guy that's going to be the bridge between the fundamentals and the greats of direct marketing that you work with many of them and bring them into the present to people I mean, there are people listening, I'm sure, that never heard of any of those six people. I yeah, yeah, sadly. Book. Yep, 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 totally. And, and I'm giving them a shortcut to six of the most incredible minds uh, that have ever lived in advertising and marketing. And I feel like, yeah, Jay, I'm taking up the gauntlet. You know, stop stop bugging me. <laughs> and, and then he wants me to write another book. And I'm, I'm we're already putting together the outline for it. And that's going to be the book all about over-delivery. Love it. You know, over delivery in both life and in direct marketing. Love and it. I'm just, um, 
I'm just living a dream. In turn, you know, as you said, you pinch yourself. Um, I, I do as well. I mean, what a great life I've been able to live. And thank goodness I didn't leave boardroom early on when I, before I was a partner and that I, I stayed there for 34 years and yep. earned direct marketing from some of the greatest minds ever. And I got the most of them to speak at, at the Titans event, you know, between Dan Kennedy and Joe Sugarman and Jay Abraham and Perry Marshall and, you know, one after another. And so, man, I just want to keep sharing this stuff. So being on a podcast with you is, a, is, is you know, pinch me again. Awesome. 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 Well, Brian, uh, I can't say enough great things about you. You've inspired me. We are going to do a direct mail campaign. We're gonna, I'm, I'm going to go hog wild on this segmentation. I'm at my next, uh, next time in, in a year from now, we'll, when we do, uh, our Brian Kurtz at O'Keefe interview part three, we'll, we'll get to go into some deep diving on some stats. <laughs> so I'm, I'm into it, man. All right. you, know, you know, you know, I'm always here to help you and anybody in your tribe that thinks they, would want to, you know, hang out. Do I mean, I, I'm like, uh, I'm just open to big new ideas all the time. Awesome. All right, brother. Well, thanks so much. And uh, thanks to everyone else. Uh, the, I hope you enjoy this. Let us know what you think. Post it, share it, ping it. Really help uh, Brian and myself get this message out because if it wasn't for direct response marketing, I would, I don't know if I'd be bartending still or what I'd be doing, but uh, I definitely I'd would not. be living in a box outside the Port Authority bus terminal. <laughs> <laughs> Craziness. All right, brother. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hey, it's Ed. Really quickly. Hopefully you enjoyed that interview with Brian Kurtz. Now, if you liked the interview I did with Brian, here's a couple other interviews that I highly, highly recommend. Um, one I just did with Ezra Firestone, Facebook video ads mastery, but really more importantly that if you like direct response, um, you get to see how a guy like Ezra actually utilized direct response on Facebook and how things have kind of shifted in that platform. That's one. I also think you'll love the interview that I did recently on, uh, Jeremy Weiss's, um, podcast called inspired insider so please check that out to support uh jeremy and here's my little ireland running up here with a little yogurt she wants me to open so i'll make this quick um and that's it so if you enjoyed this episode please share it please check out the other things we got going on and uh, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next amazing episode oh and by the way if you are looking for men more mental toughness uh fun things like that check out the david goggins episode that has gotten over uh, 20,000 views or downloads. That's been the highest downloading uh, podcast I've done to date. That won't be uh, the highest one, I promise that. But um, people love it from all walks of life, and I know you will love it just as much. So that's it. This is Ed O'Keefe. I appreciate you. Share this with others. I need the help and support so that this podcast gets out there and uh, keeps making an impact across the globe, one person at a time. That's it. Thanks to Brian, and thanks to everyone else. Peace out. Can you say goodbye, Ireland? Say goodbye. Bye. I love you. Love you. <laughs> All right, that's it. Bye-bye. <laughs>